define ourselves here with? Hurley Haywood. And? Gregory Von Hausch. Okay. For those of you who don't know, uh, we have someone very special here sitting next to uh, uh, Mr. Greg Von Hausch of the St. Augustine Film Festival. Uh, if you're into cars and racing, this is uh, one of these um, very, very special people on the planet who do this, did this very dangerous sport of racing cars. Um, when would you say you were active in your race career? What were the years that you were active? Well, I started with Peter Gregg in 1969. Oh, wow. We won a world championship race in Watkins Glen, which is upstate New York. And then I got the dreaded draft notice and was shipped to Vietnam. So I spent all of the latter part of 69 and 70 in Vietnam and came back. Started with Peter again in 71. And I was 100% active in the sport until 2012, is when I retired. 2012 marked my 40th start at the Daytona 24 hour race. Uh, I had, had a lot, lot of luck winning that race. I got five, five overall wins there, so I figured that uh, if I managed to make it through 40, 40 years, uh, <laughs> that was time to stop, so that's when I quit. You know, I was one of the few guys around that you know, started with a car that was basically a slightly modified production car, a 911, and those cars worked themselves up to pr pr tr true prototypes very fast cars, 240 mile an hour <laughs> automobiles. So uh, I get to, I got to see a lot of technology, both on the car side and on the you know safety side, mm. the equipment that we would wear. And so it was, it's kind of a neat perspective to have. You had to be in shape to be driving for so long. These, uh, you know, when you read the Daytona 24, the Le Mans 24, this is not a couple hours around and laps. This is uh, well. It's it is a little deceptive because I don't sit in the car for twenty four well, yeah, hours and clear. drive. So I have teammates. So mm -hmm. at, at Le Mans, I've won that race three times. You're allowed three drivers, three co-drivers. So you have yourself and two other guys. At Daytona, usually the more professional teams use four guys, and you can have up to six guys there. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the stress at Daytona is because of the banking and just because of all the variables of traffic situations and the speed of you know one car could be considerably faster than another car. It's just a little more stressful. So it's, it, it, the, you have both the physical and the mental part working against you. So it's better to have a, a fresh, fresh guy waiting to get in. And usually you run either two or three hour stints you know, it's basically a stint as a tank of, of gas, and the tank of gas usually lasts for about an hour. So um, it all kind of works out perfectly. All right, so here's, a, here's another question. Of all the speedways you've been on, which one would you consider the most difficult or most challenging? Well, you know, that's kind of a, a long answer to that question. Okay. Um, you know, I like the old traditional racetracks. I like high-speed corners, you know, very fast corners, um, where a lot of the tracks that are being built, um, they're shorter, you know, shorter straightaways and slower corners. So, but each one has its own challenge. Every single racetrack I've ever been on all over the world uh, has its challenge, and you just have to adapt to it. I tend to not try to dislike a track because when you dislike a track you're not going to do well so i kind of lump, lump them all together and the tracks that uh, i really like are the ones that are closest to the airport and have the best <laughs> hotels and restaurants around <laughs> so here's a, here's another question is how young were you when you kind of realized that that's what you like to do was racing cars i uh, <clears throat> started driving a full-size car when i was 12 years old well, we yeah. had, uh, I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and we had a bunch of farms out west of the city. The main one where my grandmother lived um, had a lot of different types of roads. So our farm foreman built some, a special seat and blocks on the pedals. It was a three-speed transmission, 
1948 Studebaker truck, oh, and uh, away I went at 12 years old. And I drove for several years with without my family knowing about it. <laughs> and uh, so by the time I got to be 16 years old, I was pretty, pretty... Uh, you were hooked. Yeah, pretty hooked mm -hmm. and pretty uh, reasonable behind the wheel. So it just kind of all went from there. All right. Now the reason we're here is because not only do you have this long career with a lot of accolades, but there's a film that's been made about your life. Could you tell us a little bit about that project? Well, it's, it's really pretty interesting. The, the, uh, there's also a book called Hurley from the beginning. And the book and the documentary came out about the same time. They both started to get their legs about the same time. And uh, Patrick Dempsey was the producer of the documentary and he came to me, we were at a race together in, in Atlanta. And he said, you know, I think to do a documentary on your life, on what racing was like in the 70s and 80s would be an interesting film for people to see. And I kind of thought about it and um, he introduced me to Derek Dodge, who was the actual filmmaker. Um, and I started thinking about it and I, I, I recalled a gentleman that came to my office at Brumos and uh, he asked for an interview. And it's kind of interview that I had done hundreds of times before about racing, about the business of racing. He was a, college, a, a high school senior. And about halfway through the interview, he stopped cold in his tracks and he said, you know, every morning I wake up and I think about committing suicide. I've been bullied my entire life and I just, I feel like I just have no future. I don't know what to do. I'm just trapped and I think I'm just worthless. And I said, you know, that's not a, a good place to be. And I said, we all have hurdles that we have to knock down in our lives. And when you let the, the hurdle stand in front of you and you don't move forward, then you're not going to go anywhere. But you can, if you put your mind to doing something that you want to do and you think is important, you will be able to succeed in, in getting past that hurdle. So we talked about a few. He said, you know, he was gay and he didn't know what to do. And I told, it was the first time I actually told anybody outside of my immediate circle of friends and, and teammates that I was gay. And he said, you know, gee. And so we gave him a, a couple places where he could go to get some help. And about a year and a half later, his mother called up. I didn't know it was his mother, but she called and she said, you don't, you've never met me, but you granted an interview to my son, who was a senior in high school. And I just wanted to tell you that you saved his life. So when that, you know, when that comes from a mother, um, that's a pretty heavy thing. So I had that in the back of my mind. This was several years before the, before the uh, project got started. So when Patrick came to me with this proposal and I, you know, was racing in the, in the 70s and 80s at the top of the, of, of my game and I was gay during those times and, seven, and during the 70s and 80s being gay was right. not very accept, mm -hmm. acceptable, especially in the racing world. And yet my teammates and my, the manufacturers that I drove for, it never was an issue as long as I was able to beat the guy next door to me. <laughs> And um, it was just something that was basically pretty much accepted mm -hmm. because I did my job well. Right. And as you move forward and kids today um, have an image that maybe is not so positive when you're, when you're gay and you're looking at the people that are on TV and in the movies that are gay, the, the, the image is not something that is, is good all the time. And I figured, well, if, you, if, if my voice was strong enough to save one kid, then it might save two kids or 10 or 100. So I agreed to do it, and then it, it just sort of took off. We went in a couple different directions at the beginning of the film, but uh, it all kind of came together, and it really turned out to 
to be something that was pretty powerful and it was totally unexpected from my standpoint to see the reactions of so many different types of people. Um, grown men would come up with tears in their eyes and said, you know, I, I've, I have these issues in my own family on my own son or my own daughter and you taught me sort of how to, to cope with that. And that's an important thing. We live in a world that, you know, is, is so harsh to everybody. It's a violent world. We all kind of are bullied around and it's just time that we sort of sort of step back and say, you know, let's, uh, instead of punching somebody in the face, why don't you pat them on the back? I, I think, you know, I told this young gentleman, I said, one of the most important things that you can remember or that you have to get at the front of your, your head is not, it's not, it's not what you are, it's who you are. Okay. It's the who part. I remember reading what, that quote. What, pe mm -hmm. what Very people powerful. remember. So I think, you know, that's what, what people remember about the type of person that you are, um, not what you are. You can be black, green, purple, mm -hmm. gay, lesbian, doesn't make any difference. Have you seen the finished product of the film? <laughs> many, many times. Okay, and and what do you th um, what do you think people will come out at the end feeling, or you hope, or you think? Well, I think everybody takes away something different from it. Okay. Um, you know, if you're if you're gay or lesbian or transsexual, it it gives you hope that says, okay, you know, if I put my mind, if I want to do something, I shouldn't let anything stand in my way. If somebody said, no, you can't do that. Yes, I can. Who mm -hmm. are you to tell me I can't do it? Right. And but you have to do it. You have to do it well, and you have to do it um, with integrity, and you have to do it, you know, in a meaningful way. You just can't take something that you decide to do that's just flutterverse and nobody cares about it. You have to do something that's worthwhile. So, um, but you know, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything you want to do. All right. Now, now to Gregory now. Um, you're going to show this film in the St. Augustine Film Festival, mm -hmm. which is when again? We run uh, January 17 to nine, uh, to 20, 17 mm -hmm. to 20. And, and why did you find this film interesting? Oh, well, what's unique about this film and what I really like about it is, number one, I didn't know much about car racing. Number two, I didn't have much of a desire to know anything about car racing. <laughs> And so that was a delight for me because the film is what we call a crossover film. It'll mm -hmm. appeal to people that like car racing, it'll mm -hmm. appeal to a gay audience, it'll appeal to a straight audience. Mm -hmm. It is a very universal film mm -hmm. in all of its themes and the way it's presented, it's so interesting and intriguing and engaging. Uh, the archival footage, uh, the lifestyle that you experienced, not only personally, but just the whole uh, milieu of, of, the, of the race industry right, right. Is, is fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I knew my people would really enjoy it down in Fort Lauderdale. They, they certainly did. Mm -hmm. Here the film will play on Saturday, January 19th, 2.15 at Lewis Auditorium. And oh, I'm wow. really so glad. I'm a big audience then. Yeah. yeah well, we're yeah. really going to need it because there's probably more interest in this film than any of the films in the festival. Fantastic. So we're anticipating perhaps the biggest crowd. We, we can hold a, about 850, about 832 seats I think it has. Wow. And uh, not only will Hurley be there to introduce the film and do Q&A afterwards, ask but, that. Mm -hmm. but he'll have his race cars uh, at the thing, his, um, his 819. The 918, which is the movie, uh, which will, will be there. It's and that's a, that's a Porsche, of Yeah, it's a Porsche. And then we'll also have uh, the B59, which is a, a tribute car that Porsche factory did that commemorates my five wins at Daytona, which is a cool car. So mm -hmm. we'll have both of those cars there. And how many people have won five times at Daytona? Just one other person. That's Scott Pruitt. And he's also retired, so... So he and I share that uh, mantle. Yeah, you won't take it away from me. So you. they'll be yeah. parked right outside on the piazza right in front yes. of Lewis. That'll be awesome. And, uh, and then prior to the event, at uh, 1130 at the Casa Monica, there will be a luncheon with Hurley. 
and um, the cost of the luncheon is $59.59, .59, and 59 being Hurley's number that he had as a, as a race car driver. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be at the beautiful Casa Monica. All of these, all the proceeds for this and another event that I'm getting to are donated to two charities through the United Way. And um, you can go have lunch with Hurley before the film. Uh, if you want to get a book signed, you, you have to order that in advance and posters I think will also be available. But you'll be able to do that online and, and uh, we'll take care of it and he'll autograph it for you. Not at the event, but in, in advance. Then, of course, the film that I said he'll Hurley will be there to introduce, and the <laughs> director Derek Dodge will be there as well. I understand. And also, uh, Will Sullivan, who Will Sullivan. is the uh, editor. Editor, yep. All right. And uh, so that's two fifteen at uh, Lewis, and then following Hurley's Q and A, uh, there will be a, a VIP uh, reception up at the Solarium atop Ponce Hall, and the cost of that. Uh, and this is very VIP. The cost of that is $300 a person or $500 for a couple. Mm -hmm. And once again, all of those proceeds, 100% of the proceeds will benefit the, the United Way charities that uh, Hurley and his partner are, are endorsing. Well, this is awesome. This is awesome. So thank you for all that information. I'll, I'll end it with one question. Why the number 59, Hurley? <laughs> That's a... That's a question that's asked many times, and it's very simple. Um, Peter Gregg, who was my original teammate, uh, Peter owned Bermos Porsche at that time, and Peter was a naval officer, and uh, he was flying out to the Forester, which was based here in Jacksonville at Mayport, and uh, landed on the aircraft carrier, and at the front and the, and the nose of the aircraft carrier was the number 59. He one liked liked the number fifty nine, and two he liked the font that the fifty nine was in. So that's mm -hmm. how the the fifty nine came about. All yeah, right. Well, thank you both. Um, Merry Christmas while we're at it, mm -hmm. and uh, I just cannot wait for this film and the film festival, which has become such a huge event in St. Augustine. Thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. All right.